Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to KMFA. I love this space. It's one of my favorite spaces in Austin. And I'm told the piano is really great. It's fantastic. Really nice piano. Excellent. Really great. So um, thanks to KMFA for having us this evening. And um, just a little bit about why we're here together. Um, normally for the operas, I do something called conductor cues. Um, and what I ch my goal with it is to get a little deeper into subject matter than just things you could find in Wikipedia, right? To kind of give you an inside glimpse of the piece and what about it um, we, we want you to know to enhance your experience. And um, the great thing about tonight is, you know, we're, we're expanding the scope of this, which is really great. And so I have with me Michelle Schumann um, from the Austin Chamber Music Center. And we're just gonna have a conversation um, about Beethoven. Um, and you're going to hear a couple of performances. We are adjusting the program slightly because one of the singers who was going to join us tonight um, did not make it in time. Um, but we still have um, our leading, our main leading lady here with us. Um, so we've got some wonderful performances for you. And um, but the title that we that. Michelle and I came up with Beethoven as dramatist. Um, we wanted to start kind of bringing um, the lens of what makes uh, Beethoven's only opera something special, and then, but from a musician's standpoint, why Beethoven? And uh, you know, not just why are we doing this opera, but why is this a, a composer about whom we talk incessantly? And, and we spend all of our time as musicians, you know, learning Beethoven sonatas. And, you know, when you're learning, uh, you know, uh, theory, you're studying Beethoven string quartets. And, and so, you know, there's such a seminal figure musically in, in music history. So I'm just going to ask you, why Beethoven? Yeah, it's a love affair, isn't it? It's an amazing love affair, especially between musicians and, and Beethoven, and then, of course, between audience members, too. And it was, it's always thrilling to me when there's synergy in a city in terms of, like, what things are being presented. And so when I knew that that Austin Opera was doing Fidelio and we were doing a big, one of the biggest violin sonatas uh, at the end of this month on April 22nd, 23rd, it was like, how great to be able to talk about these things in context. Because the fact of the matter is so, so often, maybe you as audience members too, we feel like it's all separate music, that there's there are piano sonatas over here and then there are string quartets over here. And then there's the opera the Beethoven only did one of those. And, but there's this incredible synergy between all of Beethoven's music, of course. And what I find really amazing about the different styles is that we talk in each other's terms all the time. So um, in this violin sonata that you're going to hear, like all in rehearsal, all we do is talk about drama. All we do is talk about the story of the piece. All we do is talk about like, what is Beethoven trying to say and does that matter? What do we want to say? You know, what is the story behind the story of those things? And I think also in terms of opera as well, it's, I mean, you have this blessing of the text, right? The text that can can um, inform so many things, but then the, the orchestra gets to be this central character also in leading the drama of, of that as well. So all these things are interspersed. And I don't think Beethoven thought about it as different. You know, I think for Beethoven, for him, music was this expression, and whether there were words driving that through, or whether that was an instrument, or whether that was a voice of any sort, it all has that idea of communicating something ah, that, that might include text, but always goes beyond the text you know, to a kind of a bigger context or even a subtext as well. Mm. Beautifully said. Thank you and good night. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, this is uh, exactly right. Um, and I think um, just a little bit, I want to touch on what you said about context, and then we'll get a little bit more into Beethoven as the man and the composer. Um, but in regards to context, what you're saying is true. And I remember when I was a student and I had the opportunity to work with a really, uh, at that point, the, the best, you know, most well-known musician I'd ever worked with. And he really changed my life in a lot of ways in a, in a short matter of time. And I remember him talking about that and saying, 
you know, this is, because um, we were working on both vocal and non-vocal music. And so, and, and him talking about, you know, it's really, when you're doing opera or art song or something, you've got text that gives you all of the dramatic context, right? So even in opera with an overture, like the Fidelio overture, well, I have context because I know what the references are. I know who those characters are. And so it even defines musically what's happening if there's a forte, which is the Italian word for strong, or we interpret it often as loud, when it should really, it really means strong. Um, but why? What is it, right? Um, I'm, I'm conducting a production of Don Giovanni right now in Houston, and one of the orchestra musicians yesterday at after, after rehearsal said, so that's Fort Sando. Is it warm? Is it sharp? Well, I can answer that question very quickly because I know what character it's associated with um, in, in the dramatic context. But um, Michelle brings up this interesting point that when you're doing music that doesn't have that kind of leading uh, part of it, that you are creating that context, uh, and especially in something like Kreutzer where it's very much there's a lot of tension in the piece. Yeah, and I think the way Beethoven does that in instrumental music, he does it in so many different ways. But let me give you one like very basic way, is, um, is what he does between the two instruments. So in this case, he writes for violin and piano. Beethoven wasn't the first composer to write uh, sonatas for violin and piano. Um, uh, Mozart wrote a bunch of violin and piano sonatas, but do you wanna know the insider? They weren't called Violin sonatas. You know what they were called? True story. They were called piano sonata with violin obbligato. <laughs> a little bit of violin on the side, mostly piano, right? Beethoven changes all of that. He's the first one to really be like, no, these are going to be equal instruments. Um, uh, and that means, <laughs> that's kind of a bummer for violinists because things get rough on violinists, <laughs> finally. Um, and you're going to notice it, that in this piece is that there's just this interplay. In fact, the piece begins, the, the Kreutzer Sonata that Patrice uh, Klickstein and I are going to play, it begins with solo violin, but not one line. He plays the, the violinist playing these big chords. <laughs> Again, it's, it's a little cruel. So he has it almost trying to sound like, like piano. So the violin has his part, and then the piano plays virtually verbatim what the violinist just played. And then you have this back and forth. So there's a conversation and kind of this idea of, um, uh, of almost the instruments at being at odds with one another, trying to like find their way to each other, but having that kind of contrast and conflict with each other. And so you can hear that conversation happening between the instruments. And it's, it's interesting what you said about, about dynamics because that is our sort of text in many ways when we don't have words to go by. When a composer writes forte, strong, you, you see that in a certain place. And Beethoven reserves every once in a while to have like fortissimo, so two, two Fs. He doesn't put them everywhere. He has them in very specific places. And so you have the sense that you wanna be, you wanna have a sound that is dense and stronger, stronger than anything else you've heard before. And when I, we were rehearsing, Patrice and I were rehearsing the other day, we're playing, rehearsing, 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 we get to like well, about uh, just before the middle of the piece. And we're like, oh, there's a pianissimo, that, that's two Ps. So there's lots of pianos and then pianissimo. And he waited so long, I mean, Beethoven waits like four minutes to give us a pianissimo. And I was thinking, you know, I bet everyone thought there wasn't ever going to be a pianist. And Beethoven's like, yeah, I'm going to have one. I'm going to put one right there. <laughs> and so, but what, what does that mean? That is like a whisper of a whisper. That's underwater. That's like a feeling that can't maybe em emerge. We had lots of feelings, and then all of a sudden something that's so internal. And so it's really amazing to be able to take the context from that and to be able to tell the story around that. And even if it's an abstract story. Sometimes the abstract stories are what becomes universal to everyone else because we can, you know, really have those those feelings. And you can say the same thing about text, especially if it's foreign text, right? We are still able to, you're still able to tell a story beyond that through the, the feelings that are coming up in the music as well. Yeah, that's true. I, I, because, of course, I, I, I make it sound simple like we have text and so that defines everything. But as you, as you, you all know, there's subtext, and there's subtext to the subtext. And especially in certain periods, Mozart was the same, um, 
you know, and Beethoven in a lot of ways, they're saying things in the subtext that they can't say, that they would not be allowed to say otherwise. And so it's important to be always kind of mining for those details. Um, and of course, our production of Fidelio will have a very specific thesis, um, which I think is important, especially with a, a piece like Fidelio. I don't think you can do it without a thesis, um, because Beethoven certainly had a thesis about it. And um, that's a good kind of jumping off point to talk a little bit about Beethoven, the man, and kind of where these works are located in his, in his life. Uh, both the Kreutzer Sonata and um, Fidelio are in his middle period, uh, which is commonly referred to as his heroic period. And uh, other major works that we, we have, well, uh, symphonies three through seven or eight, really, uh, in that period. Ninth was quite a, quite a bit later. Um, and so this is a period where he is really specifically, and he said, we know this because he said it in letters, um, turning over a new leaf. Kind of, you know, you can hear in his early, uh, the first couple of symphonies, it, definitely the Haydn influence. Um, but, you know, he's really striking out to do something. And so when uh, we talk about um, the third symphony, the Eroica symphony, it's commonly referred to as something that really bridges us from classicism into romanticism. And a lot of that is because of what I like to call the C-sharp heard around the world, which is, um, uh, you know, he starts, first of all, he starts the third symphony with two giant tutti E-flat chords, which is new. Then he puts the theme in the cellos and the basses. And then all of a sudden in the seventh bar, he, so you're moving along in very common E flat, and then the cellos and the basses go down to a C sharp, which in music theory terms, especially in that period, people are really wondering what's going on because that's a very uncommon, it's a completely unrelated, you know, harmonic um, move, something that people would have never heard before. And it's also the scope of what he was writing with the Eroica Symphony. Um, it's, it's long, it's way longer than any, than any symphonic work that um, had been written at that time. And so he really started pushing on the boundaries of form, tonality, you know, his use of chromaticism, um, you know, like you're saying, dynamic writing. Um, and so talk a little bit about how that works in the, the, the chamber music maybe of Beethoven's middle period. Yeah, uh, Beethoven, I think, from the get-go was always into experimentation. He was always testing the limits. And at this time, or maybe right before this time, um, is when he realizes he's going deaf. So, and I always feel like, I mean, of course, this was the big tragedy for Beethoven. But I think that Beethoven's uh, inability to hear turned into the, meant that all he could hear was the imagination in his head. And it opened up doors. He didn't have to be polluted by outside sounds. He could imagine the new sounds that made, I don't think they could have existed if he would have been a hearing person. That's sort of what I think, and I think at that time when he had that shift, because he, he wrote his, the Heiligenstadt Testament, I think it was like in 1802 or something like that. So this is when he like starts writing his like basically suicide note, and he's like, I'm, I'm the greatest musician that ever lived, and my ears are failing me. And then in the end of the letter, he's like, oh no, I actually owe it to the world to achieve what I can, I can do, because the world has to have me. I mean, it's true. It's okay. We, we like egos when egos do what they need to do, right? That's important. And, um, and so I feel like he used that really to, to his ability. And that led into this world of experimentation where he didn't have to know what the result had to be. He just had to kind of go, go for that in a way. And I think it really was an exceptional kind of... Uh, lifting off point for him to go further than anyone could have gone um, as well. And it's almost like his ears were, you know, he had this almost like premonition of, of like, you'll get it eventually. Mm -hmm. Many people didn't get it at the time. 
Um, and so that sort of sort of plays out too. And then, and of course, with his chamber music, it's more and more complicated, more and more, I think, complicated emotionally too. It goes deeper and deeper. Many of you are familiar also with the, the late string quartets, which are complicated and sophisticated and so incredibly intensely uh, emotional and just hitting that kind of core of that. And that was what he was trying to do all the time was to be able to really bring that across. It's an interesting thing that you say about, um, you know, and you mentioned this earlier when we were chatting about his inner ear versus his outer ear um, and kind of how he was trapped there. And I think that's an interesting point. Um, but we know that he was very connected to the music even when he was going deaf because he was still conducting it. I mean, he did conduct the premiere of... Um, let's, let's, the, do, let, let's show them how it looked. Okay, you be Beethoven and I'll be, uh, I'll be the so assistant. kind of waving along. And there's an assistant, you know, <laughs> yes. So, <laughs> so actually Beethoven, so Fidelio was revised twice and then it was done again um, the, for the third revision, which is what we commonly perform now um, in eight, uh, 1814, thank you. Um, uh, this same assistant conductor, um, can, you know, stood there and assisted through the performance. Um, and, and the same thing almost 10 years later for Beethoven 9, same guy. Um, so it's, uh, it's a very interesting thing though to think about Beethoven um, in the context in which he was writing. So if we place him in Vienna, which was an extraordinarily conservative um, city, especially at that time, uh, probably one of the most conservative environments um, in the world. And, but there were, um, you know, Europe was really fraught with a lot of different sort of conflicts. Um, you know, it, it, when Fidelia was premiered, uh, uh, Vienna was occupied by the French at that time. And so most of the people who went were French military officers who didn't care about German opera. Um, but, you know, it's to talk about the context uh, kind of in, in Europe. And, and here you have this man who he's into revolution. And he's talking about big ideas, and he's quoting things surreptitiously. If we talk about the Fifth Symphony, the knocking on the door, that's a quote from um, another hymn that's a revolutionary hymn. And again, it's text that he could have never set without getting into a lot of trouble, but it's very pointed reference. And so let's talk a little bit, I'd love to hear your ideas on kind of how did his surroundings influence him musically and whether he was pushing against something or what's the context for us there? Yeah, I think Beethoven was conflicted many times because he, he moves to Vienna because Vienna is the place to be. If you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. That was Vienna, it wasn't New York, it was Vienna then. And so he moves there and really, you know, he's, his calling cards are, and he's a performer as well, he's a pianist, of course, and so, um, and what's interesting, actually, his opus one, so he had composed before that, but his opus one um, is the first pieces that he chose to be published, kind of his like, here I am, and he was in Vienna at the time, and there are piano trios, which was really unusual, actually. No one had really taken the piano trio, which means uh, violin, cello, piano, really that seriously. And the Beethoven says, this is my opus one, and they're fantastic, they're unbelievable pieces of music. And I, I think Beethoven always had the conflict of not, mm, he was an individual all the way, did things his way. He had lessons with Haydn, but he was like, ah, Haydn doesn't really know what he's talking about. Um, but so he was his own man, independent, had his own spirit, um, and wasn't interested in being a populist composer, but he needed that too. So I think he was really conflicted between wanting to be independent and yet needing the crowd and wanting to be wanting to be loved but not wanting to care about being loved. And so I think that that's like part of Beethoven's whole psyche at all times. It's just constant conflict between wanting to achieve potential but not wanting to care about that achievement. And I think that that's another reason why he's able to take so many risks all the time, because he just, in the end, is like, mm, I don't care that much if this works, because I know, I know in 250 years, everyone's gonna be sitting at KMFA <laughs> talking about me. <laughs> yeah, it's true, and I was thinking about this earlier today, that what, it's interesting that Beethoven, during his lifetime, never heard a lot of his music played very well. 
Um, I mean, there it's are. Hard. The, it's hard. It's very hard. And, you know, and if you can imagine if, you know, most of the players in an orchestra are used to playing a Haydn symphony, which is not easy, but then they're given the, something of, you know, the scope of the Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. I mean, there are anecdotal things about him even conducting. There was some sort of gala performance he conducted once where they did a whole bunch of uh, selections of his work and him even yelling at the orchestra during the performance. Um, <laughs> you know, that it was you know wrong again and badly played, and, you know. So it really wasn't until after he died that the performance standard caught up. Um, so not only is he trapped inside his own head and he never was completely deaf, he could always sort of hear low tones or really sudden, loud things. I wonder why he started Eroica that way. Mm -hmm. um, um, but, it, you know, also the, the fact that to never really hear it done how it happens in here um, is something to think about. Well, shall we hear yeah. some music? Yeah, let's, so let's segue into the first a musical selection. It's a good segue because we just said the music's hard. This is a really hard piece. Um, like it's noted, you know, noted to be one of the, the most difficult sonatas for violin and piano. Um, it's called Kreutzer because it was written and dedicated to a great violinist at, at the time. His name is Rudolf Kreutzer and everyone calls it the Kreutzer Sonata. Mm. I just found out today that Kreutzer hated it. He's like, I'm not playing this piece. I can't stand it. So I'm like, Patrice and I were talking, I'm like, why did the, the, the moniker stick? Anyway, so that the moniker has stuck. And it's, um, I mean, it's everything that we've sort of talked about, this idea of like um, s struggle against uh, kind of difficulty, contrast, conflict, and then somehow coming together amidst all of that too. Incredibly dramatic. And I'm uh, really happy to have Patrice Kalik stay playing. He's, of course, in your orchestra. He's a fantastic violinist. Um, and so uh, we should welcome him to the stage. All right, Patrice, thank you.
Amazing. I feel like we just heard an opera. Um, you, you know what was particularly fun about this performance? So you know in chamber music, like this piece or this movement then will be followed by two more movements. A big variation movement and then a finale, which is really exciting too. So nobody ever claps after the first movement. <laughs> that piece deserves a clap after the first movement, right? Damn right. Actually, and of course, and you've probably heard this story before, that was not a tradition in Beethoven's time to hold your applause. So in fact, they would have never really programmed the whole sonata. It would have been, oh, it would have been like tonight, right? Yes. They would do concerts where they would do a movement of this, and then maybe a movement of string quartet, and then an, and then an opera aria. Mm -hmm. And then other things too, and everything would get applause. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And we, yeah, we. Th it's funny because we think about all of these things as standard, um, you know, pro Tradition, forma things, yeah, right? Practice, right? But um, you know, most of them are actually are not. Um, you know, even like Liszt was the one, the first one who turned the piano this way. You know, he was a very famous recitalist. He was, he was like also, a rock star. Yeah, he was also the first to play from memory. So solo piano, things from memory. So if I ever come across him, I'm going to punch him in the, in the, <laughs> nut, in the neck. Yeah. So many sleepless nights. Aww. Yeah, yeah. No idea. <laughs> you know, it's, I'm so glad you chose that movement because it's, it's really, that predates the Eroica Symphony by about a year if I'm... If I have my dates right, because that's 1804, right? And Eroka's 1805. But even there, you hear, if you can especially place yourself in early 19th century, you know, salon or hall, and hearing the, the, the harmonies that happen when the piano comes in just in the first few bars are pretty astonishing. And, and, the, and, the, and the scope of musical texture that happens in that movement is really astonishing. Yeah, it's so much bigger than anything else. And like in the, yeah, the range from the smallest, most intimate feelings really to these like massive, like bigger than, bigger than you can even expect of yourself uh, kind of feelings and, and uh, sounds. I think that leads us into Beethoven as dramatist. Uh, really well. Speaking of bigger, bigger than bigger sounds. <laughs> right, and just to give you a little context for Fidelio, <clears throat> he actually ab abandoned um, an opera that he was writing. Um, he was living at the Theater an der Wien when he moved to Vienna, um, and part of the deal was he was writing an opera, um, and the intendant of that theater at the time was Emanuel Schickenheiter, who was the librettist for Magic Flute. So he was an impresario and, and librettist. And um, so there was a project that um, Schikaneder had commissioned. And um, Beethoven was writing it and not super in love with it. And then he found the libretto to Fidelio and dumped the first project, um, which meant he also had to find a new place to live. <laughs> um, <clears throat> um, so, uh, and so from there, set about, uh, about writing this. And um, it was premiered in 1805, and rather unsuccessful. And uh, he had a lot of feedback after the premiere performances. Um, and I try and play this out as a scene in my head, but a lot of you know friends and people he apparently trusted, you know, told him it was too long and um, needed a lot of refining. I mean, can you imagine that conversation like, at the bar? Like five measures too long. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> And they're like, uh, we're no, thinking an like act an act, act to, right? Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> um, but uh, you know, I think what's interesting about him writing an opera, and by the way, he wrote it and then um, never wanted to write another one again. And so when he revised it for the second time, um, and it was re-premiered in 1814, um, he, he, it was another librettist helped him kind of do a lot of the revising, and he wrote that person a letter Hold on, I wrote this down somewhere. Oh yeah, he said, um, he wrote this librettist and he said, you have by your cooperation saved what is best from the shipwreck. <laughs> um, and made it very clear that he had no desire to write another, uh, another opera, that he didn't enjoy the process. Um, thankfully, he wrote, he wrote this one. And why, why do you think that is? Why do you think it wasn't a successful like, um, endeavor? I mean, it was in the end, the product was successful, but why do you think that was? What made it hard for Beethoven? I didn't ask him this ahead of time, so. Yeah. 
I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to call a lifeline. Um, no, I'm kidding. Um, um, <laughs> um, no, I, I, well, it's interesting. It's a different craft, right? And I think a lot of people, it's why some conductors don't like doing opera, because it opens you to a wealth of things that can go wrong that normally, you know, are not available. Um, but, you know, but about creating a format, and um, I think when you come to when the text comes first, that really creates a entirely different approach to composition. Um, and I think I posit that then perhaps that's something he didn't relate to and that he wanted to really sort of follow his own musical instincts um, in, in, in developing music. Well, and also he was such a formal, like there's so, he has such incredible use of form in his music and how he comes back to themes and he, it, he doesn't, he's not a cookie cutter user, but he's always, um, he's using traditional forms in his way and maybe felt like there was just too many possibilities. Huh? It could be, yeah. I, he was definitely a, a person of his own. Um, he was the first one to, you know, in a symphony, reintroduce a new theme late, um, which he even does in the, it's in the eighth symphony he does it. It's really interesting. You think you've heard everything and then all of a sudden he throws in this new theme towards the end. Um, so, you know, he was certainly an individual um, and, and, you know, creating his own path. Fidelio, um, of course, came to be much more successful after, um, after Beethoven's death and has become a really important piece and is tied to a lot of really important dates. Um, it was the first opera performed in Berlin after World War II. None of the opera houses were standing, um, but there was an, another theater. Um, it was, uh, it reopened the... Um, Vienna Schatzoper, about 10 years after that. It took them almost a decade to rebuild the house that had been bombed. Um, and then even in, the, in 89, in Dresden, there was a performance, and this was, um, there was a performance in, you know, in support of the DDR. Yeah, it's the 40th, East Germany, anniver the 40th anniversary of, the, of, of East Germany, and they yeah. programmed the work. And yeah. It was almost riotous. Uh, yeah, and there yeah. were there were very serious riots at the train station in Dresden that day, and that, um, and, um, and about four weeks later, the Berlin Wall came down. So it's interesting that it's been programmed in a, in a lot of environments, and very specifically, I don't think these are accidents, right? And so we have to start looking at the piece and saying, well, what is it, right? What is it about the piece, and what is it about Beethoven and his style and and, and um, everything that he put out there? And I think a lot of it is that these are things that people want to relate to. Heroism being a, a big one. You know, um, commitment, um, brotherhood. Uh, you know, these are a lot of themes that I think people really found and that, and that Beethoven was a very political person. Um, we, you know, we know he was very political. In fact, there's anecdotally a lot of things people say that, he, especially later in his life, none of his friends wanted to go to dinner with him because all he wanted to do was talk politics. <laughs> Not that we've ever met someone like that. Um, <clears throat> um, but, um, you know, that he was a very, and, and these things come out in the work, for sure. Yeah, there are these universal truths and that, that and I, I think also Toscanini was the first piece that he programmed when he did his first NBC performance. That's right. And so he used that for that That's too. Right. So somehow like using this work to tell a bigger story that everyone can can relate to. And I think that that's what Beethoven always wanted to do, even though there were these conflicts and political conflicts, like what, what can we all agree on and what are these themes? And that really exists within Fidelio. Yeah, I agree. And it's, uh, there's something about the scope of his composition that I think, even though he may not have liked it, works really well for opera, right? There's a towering presence that we hear in his music, even when it's just, you know, chamber music. I just, just shouldn't say, I know, I said, <laughs> as soon as I said that, I... Well, because you saw my face, I was like, No, 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 I mean, it was... I heard the word coming out of my mouth, and I was like, Tim? No. no Tim, no. no, no. No, but Good. there is a sense, maybe just, maybe just two people, but, but there is a yes. sense that you can tell a big story with, with one voice, but there is also a sense that when the orchestra, like that, the, the, the mass of voices together, it can tell a, oh, well, not a bigger story, but like a, a story that we can all kind of get in a way, too. 
That's right. And I, th I, I think that, look, Mozart certainly had it nailed when, I mean, in sort of orchestrating in a certain way to tell a story. And, and, and a lot of times, m you know, Mozart is commenting or providing subtext in the orchestra. I think Beethoven takes that to a new level. If you put it in the context, this came out eight or nine years before Verdi was even born. And um, it, it, I was, we're studying um, on the way here today the, um, the um, Pizarro Rocco duet that's before the aria we're gonna hear. Um, and I thought, man, this is, this is Verdi duet writing at its best before Verdi was born. And so it's really astonishing how he was able to grasp a lot of these things and how to put something across in a really dramatic way and using the orchestra um, to power it. Because remember, at this period of time, mo I mean, Italian opera was by far leading the pack. And it was Rossini, Bellini, Donizetti, right? And so you certainly don't hear the kind of writing in those operas that Beethoven does in Fidelio, even just from an orchestration standpoint. Well, and even in the sense of like contrast of, of texture, contrast of dynamics, contrast of, um, of tempo. So yeah, when you think about a Rossini aria, there's, there's usually a contrast. So there's like, it's slow, and then it's fast. And then it gets faster at the end, right? We all know that. Um, but Be I mean, when you hear the aria that you're gonna hear now, Slow, fast, slow, fast, slow, fast, slow, fast. Yeah. I mean, there's just t a ton of that, and stops, and and restarts, and it's just amazing. And then also, like, um, uh, you'll hear in the in the orchestra or in the piano, in this case, like just going from the low registrations to high registrations, and really showing the colors of the orchestra. And and I love when the orchestra changes the the mind of the of the oh. singer so you're going in one direction yeah. and the orchestra kind of interjects with a new idea and it creates a new motivation for the, for the music in that way so that's why i was saying like i feel like the orchestra is a character not just supporting the drama but actually commenting on and sometimes delivering a different um direction for it yeah and it's and it is like chamber music in that with you and Patrice, right, there's a cat and mouse game happening there. Mm -hmm. There's some of us against them kind of thing happening. There's this tension. And I think you're right, orchestrally, good opera does the same thing, right? And you, so you're, you're always wondering, well, who's introducing, is, is the character introducing this music or is this music introducing something about the character, right? And these are the, cl the clues that you're always looking for um, when you're interpreting something. Back to orchestration about this aria that we're going to hear, when you hear it at one of our performances on April 29 or May 1st. Um, <laughs> thank you. Got, got a thumbs up from the boss. Yeah. Um, uh, is um, that she's accompanied by three horns in, in a very, very heroic fashion. And this is something that had never been done before. At this period of time in opera writing, horns play in the middle of their range almost exclusively, and they play long harmonies. They're just kind of filler, right? Um, and in opera, it really wasn't until we got more towards the middle of the 19th century, let's say Verdi's middle period, where um, you know, they were really writing, I mean, more virtuosically um, for instruments like the horn. And so it's really fascinating how, like you're saying, there's this entirely different element. We get Leonora's heroism just from the orchestral color that Beethoven gives us and kind of wraps it in. Um, so I think we should hear it. Yeah? Yeah, okay, great. Do you wanna set, set the context for the uh the aria? I will. I, I, I'm going to have our artist talk about it, just a few words, but I do want to introduce her. Um, we're really fortunate to have with us, and by really fortunate, I mean she landed a couple, like an, an hour and a half ago. Um, um, Alexandra Lucian, who um, is singing um, the leading lady in Fidelio, she was scheduled to sing the title role of Turandot with us. Um, when that was canceled because of COVID. So we're very, very happy to have her here. 
And um, she's a really wonderful artist and I, you know, brings a lot of depth to this role that I'm excited for you to experience. And so uh, please welcome Alexandra Lucian. Could you put us in time and place and maybe a little bit of state for the character sure. um, in, in this aria? So, Leonora has been working at a prison. Um, she has disguised herself, in the traditional production, she has disguised herself as a man and is trying to free her husband who has been wrongfully imprisoned. So um, the, the characters, I'm not sure honestly how much you talked about already uh, because I couldn't hear you back there. But, <laughs> but the characters in this piece are, are very much, this one is, is good and this one is evil. So she is, she is the good one and she is fighting against the evil police chief Pizarro who is the one who falsely imprisoned her husband. So at this point in the opera, she kind of sneaks in to see that Pizarro is fighting with the jailer Rocco and um, is trying to get him to do something, but she can't quite hear what it is. And, um, but he's ranting and raving and screaming and she has a visceral reaction to it. And so that's the first part that you'll hear in this aria. Um, and she basically is like, you know, you're, you have no humanity. You're just raging around. But do you have any sense of any, anything beautiful in yourself, basically? So as she's getting frustrated and kind of trying to figure out what he's saying because she assumes it's about her husband, she, ha she has a moment where she says, no, 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 like, calm down. You're here on a, a godly purpose and you are here to save your husband. Just have faith in, in why you're here. So that's the first part of the recit. Then we get into the aria proper, which is the, the slow section of the aria. And she says, and I like, I always get a little misty actually in this piece because it's just such a beautiful sentiment, particularly right now. And she says, come hope, be the, like, don't be the last shining, like, don't be the last shining star in the sky, basically. Be, be, be the light that lights my path to, to my divine purpose, which is my love for my husband. And um, so she has this moment sort of calming herself down, talking about hope. And then we get into the more fierce part of the aria where she, um, she kind of revs herself up and she's like, I'm, I'm here for, for this, I'm here for this purpose and I'm gonna succeed and I'm gonna find him and I'm determined and nothing can stop me. And you know, I can't wait to see you again. I'm gonna give you so much comfort when I do. And then she ends on a big high note. So that's, um, Literally and figuratively. Um, <laughs> so, so that's kind of kind of where she is at this point. It's like you know, from the hopeless to the hopeful, and that is the journey of this beautiful piece of Shodisha.
right? Yeah. <laughs> See you there. I want to make sure that everyone knows when they can hear those two wonderful artists again. Uh, when you and Patrice have a program. Uh, yeah, so we have a concert on uh, not this Friday, but the following Friday and Saturday. Friday we're in here, um, and then on Saturday we're at the First Unitarian Church. We, we're doing that uh, that piece, which is an amazing big work. And then on the second half, it's the Tchaikovsky Piano Trio, just a little ditty on the second <laughs> half. <laughs> it's also amazing, humongous, uh, fabulous work, too. So I hope you will join us for that. Yeah, so check that out. Yes. <laughs> And um, please join us for Fidelio at the Long Center. It's April 29 and May 1. We've got two performances. This is a brand new production um, that is very, very interesting. And as I said earlier, I think doing a piece like this, you have to have a thesis. And there's a very, um, an excellent thesis with this production. Um, it's also exciting. You, you will see the orchestra on stage and the set is kind of built around them and through, and um, so I, I'm excited about that because I think with music like this, it's great to have the kinetic energy of the orchestra there on the stage and, and involved in the action because it's providing so much energy, and then we really get it visually and orally at the same time. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Michelle. Thank Thanks you. to our performers. Thank Thanks everyone. to KMFA. And <laughs>